I was just 10 years old when I fell head over heels in love. Now, any of you that know me will be starting to think about pretty young blonde girls or you know, brunettes with beautiful green eyes. No, I fell in love with a computer. It was the first time I'd ever seen one, it was 1977. And in that moment, I fell in love because I realized, even as a 10-year-old, this thing is going to change the world. It's absolutely going to change the world. And it changed the course of my life because I'm here today because it changed what I wanted to do with my life. Because I saw the innate goodness, the innate goodness in how a computer could change humanity for the better. And we've seen computers change dramatically over the last 60 years or so. There used to be these big, huge devices, like throbbing, make lots of noise and lots of power, that filled an entire room. And only the very select people, academics and researchers, could access them. Now, billions of people have access to computing, and we carry them around in our pockets and in our purses. The humble PC has grown from its beginnings as an office automation device, an office productivity device. And now it's this amazing supercomputer we can fold up and put underneath our arms and take with us to Starbucks. And we can do amazing 3D and multimedia. And the next step in computer evolution, we're going to start to be able to see these devices that can see us. They can hear us. They can understand us. They can feel our feelings and understand about us and about the world that they're in. I think the biggest thing that we're going to see computers do in the next 10 years or so is we're going to enable them to see. Because once a computer can see, and I don't just mean have a camera on, but really see the world, understand visually what is in front of it, suddenly a computer can do a lot more for us. A computer that can see can power a robot, a robot that can clean in our homes, that can take care of disabled and elderly to help them live in their homes. A computer that can see can drive a car, and a car that can drive itself can save a lot of accidents. It can make for car sharing models that make for a much more sustainable future. A computer that can see can power a robot which is a robot we live in. Our houses are going to turn into robots. They are going to be robots we live in that watch us, that look for us, that look out for us, that help tune the environment that we live in to make our lives easier and better. It's a dramatic breakthrough, and it's all powered by the capabilities of Moore's Law, hitting a point where suddenly we're going to see incredible opportunities and possibilities with the technology we have in front of us. What we're seeing is the, an ongoing trend here, two sides coming together. And this is something that's been happening now for two or three decades. It is the physical world and the digital world coming together. And this freaks some people out. It's going to give us some amazing capabilities. I just described a few of them. But as we shift to these natural interfaces, as, as you start to see computers that can see us, hear us, they're starting to act a little bit like us. Anybody find that a bit spooky? It does worry people, because this process of change is accelerating. It's accelerating, and it's providing discomfort for people. And we're now starting to feel we need to protect ourselves. Some people get really concerned. The future's coming. What do we do? Panic. I need to get ready for it. I need to protect myself, protect my children. Airbags, everybody, we've got to be ready. The future in my world is not something that happens to us. The future should be something that we all build together. We all own together. And I want to propose a couple of ideas that we might use as lenses to help us make sense of all of this change, not be quite so afraid about it, and to help us have the conversation about what do we want together in the future. The first idea I want to share is this idea of there being a fifth dimension, the data dimension. This object, this clicker I have in front of me, exists in 3D, up, down, left, right, forward, back. And according to Einstein, we're all sailing through the fourth dimension of time. The idea I want to propose to you is every object now can start to have a fifth dimension, a data dimension. A table, standard table, imagine I have a table in front of me here, exists in three dimensions. If I add a fifth dimension, a data dimension to that table, 
suddenly it becomes bookable in a restaurant and services like open table are born. Imagine the couch in your home. Think about it now. See your couch? It's a beautiful couch, isn't it? It's comfy. Now, what if you give your couch a data dimension? What does that do to it? Well, with a service like couchsurfing.com, this exists, you can have people come into your home and sleep on your couch. It turns your couch into a bed for the night. But perhaps more interestingly, it provides a serendipitous service for you. Because now you can have a parade of wild and interesting people coming through your home and sleeping on your couch. A friend of mine in Australia, this is, this is happening all over the world, a friend of mine in Australia does this. He loves it. He meets strange and interesting people all the time. So if you haven't tried it, you might want to think about that. And if you put a car into the fifth dimension, suddenly it becomes a shareable resource. A car in the fifth dimension with a data dimension becomes a service, a car to go, a zip car, a buzz car, a yo-yo car. All these services are rising up because these objects are finding a place in the data dimension. And once they do that, they enable entirely new economic models and the ability to think about these objects in a different way. They turn a product into a service and they make it very easy to share scarce, uh, or important or expensive resources. And it provides for a much more sustainable model. So be thinking about what other objects could we in our lives that we could take, add the fifth dimension to, the data dimension, and turn them into services and make them more sustainable. The second idea I want to share with you is that of designing experiences. Designing experiences to meet the needs and aspirations of human beings and to use that as a lens to help us figure out what we want to do. Experience we define as what you think, feel, or perceive as you before, during, and after using a product or a service. It's the whole shebang. What's the experience of using a product or service? The way we're thinking about experience at Intel, if we think about it as part of a chain that links the needs and aspirations of people down to the way that we specify the products that we make for our engineers. So needs and aspirations at the top. This could be a pain point or a particular need that a human being has. Experience is what you feel, perceive, or, or worry about when you're using a product. Usages, that's how the system or a product gets actually used. And capabilities and features in our industry is the bits and bytes of how this thing gets implemented. Now, you may be asking yourself, so Steve, um, OK, I'm in with the experiences thing, but what are the needs and aspirations of humans? What are they? Well, if you are one of the 40% of our fellow human beings that live on $2 a day or less, really, your needs and aspirations are ruled primarily by Maslow's hierarchy. It is clean water. It's food, shelter, security. And technology has an important role to play in those people's lives, too. But for the rest of the planet, with the research that we've been doing, these are the six primary needs that come forward as aspirations for all human beings. This is what people are looking for from their technology and indeed from life. They want to feel connected to each other, to their loved ones, to their families, and in a business context, to their colleagues, because we know that the tighter our connection with customers, the better. They want to express themselves creatively in whatever form works for them. And they want, at appropriate times, to be entertained. Human beings want to constantly learn and grow, to be informed, to grow themselves through their entire lives. They want to get things done. This is a segment of need that the tech industry has focused on primarily for the last 20 or 30 years. And then wellness. People want to stay well, and they want help monitoring and assisting the ones that they love and care about to stay well, too. We have a lot of change potentially coming our way. And the way I think about it, I actually am reminded of Steve Jobs, who said he, he positioned Apple at the intersection of liberal arts and technology. I think he was really smart to do that, I really do. I think similarly about the way that culture comes together with technology. And it's shown in this picture here as being sort of orthogonal, fighting each other. And in some ways, they can be. 
I mean, th this is where the fear comes from, as people worry about how is technology going to affect my life and my culture. And there are important questions that we're going to face together. The ones that we've faced in the last five years are things like, is it okay to use my cell phone when I'm at dinner with my friends? Probably not. But there are bigger ones coming that we need to think about. Should I be sequencing the DNA of my child when they're born? Is it okay to have a camera embedded in my glasses? Is a robot babysitter an adequate uh, way to look after my kids? I'm not kidding. These are the questions we're going to have to deal with. But I don't think that this is a productive way of thinking about how culture and technology come together. I want to propose a different way of looking at it. This is a beautiful photograph of a location in the northern tip of the northern island of New Zealand called Cape Renga. Renga in the Maori language actually means underworld, and all the Maori people believe wherever they are in the world, when they die, their souls, their spirits will come to Cape Renga, and that is the jumping off point to the underworld. So it's a very magical place, but it is a special place for other reasons too. It is the point where the Tasman Sea and the Pacific Ocean come together. And it's an amazing place. As you stand there, you can actually see these two different bodies of water. I had imagined that these were human constructs on a map to help us make sense of the water that covers seven-tenths of our planet. But no, these are two separate bodies of water. And you actually see in this picture here, they're different colors. And you see them crash together, and then over time, they merge, and quickly, they become one seamless body. That's the way I see culture and technology coming together. At first, there's conversation, there's discussion. How are we going to make this work? There's that crash together. But very quickly, they seamlessly move together as a whole. And that's the way we need to think about culture and technology coming together. We're going to have to have these conversations much more rapidly because the pace of technological change is only accelerating. So I want to leave you with this final thought, that as we look at the future, we look at what comes next for us, we're going to have big choices to make. As families, as individuals, as companies, as, as a society, and as we face these issues, I think we can look at that through these two lenses. How can we use the data dimension to help us share, to help us create new economic models, to help turn products into services, to help create new economic opportunity? And secondly, how can we focus on the experiences that we want, experiences that are expressly designed to help meet human needs and aspirations? Because I think if we can do these two, that it will help us to build machines that will help us be all better human beings. Thanks for your time.